I wish everything I'm going to show you was just pictures, but I am going to show you a couple things that have, you know, small numbers and regressions and that sort of thing. So, um, so uh, thanks for this opportunity, uh, Ray. So first, uh, I think in order to talk about identifying effective teachers or how to make our teacher workforce more effective, we have to first say, well, what do we mean by effective? Um, because it's not at all clear, uh, I think, it, um, when, you go, when you talk to different people, what they have in mind for that, for that exact term. So uh, effective can be an input-based concept, right? Um, it can be about observable actions or characteristics of teachers. Teachers are effective if they do these things. Teachers are effective if you know, they look like this. Um, but it can also be an outcomes-based concept. Right? Teachers who are effective are the teachers who produce this set of results for, for students. And those are two very different ways of looking at this teacher effectiveness, teacher quality issue. And we've, I think, uh, gone a bit, uh, we, we, we've gone from one side to the other recently, I think, in terms of the policy landscape. For a long time, we were thinking about qualifications, what a teacher looks like, and now we're moving towards you know, what do teachers do and what kinds of effects do they have on, on kids. Um, the recent work of economists uh, like myself and like Doug and other people, uh, we're focused on outcomes. Uh, and, and, you know, partly that's because we have no idea what good teaching looks like. You know, we're not educators, we're economists. Um, but I think it also stems from this idea that it may be very difficult to understand what makes uh, uh, teachers good, and, uh, and, and we can certainly look at outcomes we care about and ask things like, um, do teachers matter and, and why? Um, we, we use what's called a value-added approach. Lots of, I'm sure everyone in this room has heard the term teacher value-added. I'm going to spend a little time talking about what we mean by that, because um, I think it's, kind of, it's important to have a deep understanding of what value-added is all about. Um, and, you know, one thing that it's important to realize is a lot of this research that I'm going to talk about is focusing on outcomes measured on standardized tests. Okay? To the extent that you hate standardized math and English assessments, you're going to say maybe this is all hogwash. You know, if, if Chancellor Klein was here, he'd say, I got kids in my city that can't do basic uh, math and they can't uh, read and write for their grade level, and I care about the kinds of things that are being assessed on these standardized statewide uh, tests. Uh, and, and if that's your view of the world, then you will care about uh, what we have to say. Uh, the basics of value added, what's it all about? Um, it's all about measuring actual performance, actual student outcomes, relative to some counterfactual expectation. Okay? Anybody can measure student outcomes. Right? All you need to know is how to use Excel right, or how to read a, uh, a school report card and they'll tell you how many kids passed the test this year or what was their average score, or how much did they gain from last year to this year. Measuring actual student outcomes is trivial. Okay? The key thing, though, is, well, is that good enough? Right? If 80% of the kids in my school pass the exam this year, is that excellent? Am I happy? Is that terrible? Am I mortified? It all depends on what your frame of reference is. What is your counterfactual expectation? How good would these kids have done had they attended a different school? Had I given them a different teacher? Had we not used this professional development program? Right? This is exactly plays into what Caroline was talking about. Well, how good would the charter schools kids have done had they stayed in the regular public schools? Well, to get our counterfactual expectation there, we look to the kids who were lotteried out. So in, in this teacher work, we're going to think about what, building that counterfactual uh, expectation. OK, let's just suppose for a moment that we know it. Someone hands it down from above. We just know for sure the counterfactual expectation for each child. What is value-added analysis uh, about? Well, we take a kid's actual level of achievement. Okay, let's call that sorry. Let's call that counterfactual A star. Right, that's the magic number. We know that's how the kid would have done had we given them I don't know the average teacher, and we want to know whether how this teacher is doing relative to some average teacher. Well, let's just subtract the expectation. A star from the kid's actual achievement, which we can see in our Excel spreadsheet, and call that G, the gain that the kid made. Right? It may be positive and it may be negative. Positive means the kid did better than we expected them to do. This teacher did a better job with that kid than the average teacher would have done. And if it's negative, then the teacher did worse than the average teacher. Well, then we just take all the G's for all the individual kids. Let's average them all uh, across all the kids that this teacher taught. And that's that teacher's value added. On average, their kids did better or worse than they would have done 
had they been given, I don't know, the average teacher in the district. That's all there is to value added. Right? That's all there is to the math. However, how do we get a star? That's the problem. No one is going to drop it down from the heavens and tell us this is the kid's magic number. Right? We have to figure out how to get that. We have, the big question in all value added work is setting up that counterfactual expectation. Is figuring out how good this kid would have done if they had Mrs. Jones instead of Mrs. Smith. Okay? And typically, we're going to estimate that with data. That's, what we're, that's the approach we're going to take. So uh, one approach you can take, which is actually how the Boston Public Schools has started to implement their value-added analysis, take all the kids in the district, and if you have a big district like Boston or New York, you can do this, take all the kids in the district who had the same test scores as this kid last year, and ask how they did on the test. Right? That average performance of kids who looked like this kid last year, that's kind of our expectation. That's the average teacher. How did my kid do relative to, to that average? That's an example. That G, the gain the kid made, right? It may be positive and it may be negative. Positive means the kid did better than we expected them to do. This teacher did a better job with that kid than the average teacher would have done. And if it's negative, then the teacher did worse than the average teacher. Well, then we just take all the Gs for all the individual kids. Let's average them all uh, across all the kids that this teacher taught. And that's that teacher's value added. On average, their kids did better or worse than they would have done had they been given, I don't know, the average teacher in the district. That's all there is to value added. Right? That's all there is to the math. However, how do we get a star? That's the problem. No one is going to drop it down from the heavens and tell us this is the kid's magic number. Right? We have to figure out how to get that. We have, the big question in all value added work is setting up that counterfactual expectation, is figuring out how good this kid would have done if they had Mrs. Jones instead of Mrs. Smith. Okay? And typically, we're going to estimate that with data. That's, what we're, that's the approach we're going to take. So uh, one approach you can take, which is actually how the Boston Public Schools has started to implement their value-added analysis, take all the kids in the district, and if you have a big district like Boston or New York, you can do this, take all the kids in the district who had the same test scores as this kid last year, and ask how they did on the test. Right? That average performance of kids who looked like this kid last year, that's kind of our expectation. That's the average teacher. How did my kid do relative to, to that average? That's an example of how you can do it. Of course, the quality of the estimates that we get are going to depend on the quality of the data and the process that generates it. Right? The more information we have on these kids, the better job we're going, to, we're going to be able to do. If you set your expectations too low, you make the teacher look good. If you set your expectations too high, you make the teacher look bad. Okay. Um, there's some statistical problems here we might worry about, right? Systematic sorting of students is one of them that gets brought up a lot, okay? We're worried here about bias. We're worried about an unlucky teacher who year after year gets the hard to teach kids. They might not look so hard on paper, but boy, oh boy, Johnny is a pain in the butt, and this, kid always, you know, this teacher always gets the Johnnies of the world who make her life hard. That means she's going to look bad, right, if we don't understand that. Okay? Sort of unfair treatment of teachers that's systematic, like the principal's friends are getting all the easy to teach kids. The second concern is instability of the value added estimates. People talk about this a lot. You know, how stable is this from year to year? Does this really give us a good handle on how good a teacher is? Right? And here the, the, the issue isn't bias, it's just imprecision. We might be on average right when we make when we set up our value added estimates, but year to year we might get it wrong and how and we don't know how how, how noisy these things are. And if they are very noisy, then we worry about attaching real rewards and consequences. Right? Think about any profession. If someone says, you know, how many sales you make this year, that's going to determine your pay. And if that can vary lots from year to year based on you know, market conditions and things that are out of your control, you might worry about setting up a pace system like that. Right? It's going to maybe be a, a poor motivational tool, and it means you're going to make a lot of mistakes in saying who's good and who's bad. So some basic findings. We find substantial variation in value added across teachers, and this is across studies looking in different states and different cities, different methodologies. They all come up with very similar answers. So about 0.1, so race value added in a, in a district by a standard deviation, kind of moving from the median teacher to the 80th percentile teacher, you're going to raise kids' test scores by one-tenth to two-tenths of a standard deviation, which is a very big effect. So the effects that Caroline was finding would say 0.08 standard deviations are 0.09 per year in a charter school, this is how much you get per year getting a better 
getting a better teacher, point one to point two. We get a little bit more variation in math than English, and just like in charter schools, it's, I think because kids get more of their math in school and they get reading other places. Uh, and most of the variation is actually within the schools. It's not just good teachers over there and bad teachers over there. Each school has their share of good and bad teachers. Now, the conclusion, I think, from a lot of the, 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 that on some of the concerns is, I, I'd say, not totally warranted. I think that bias and precision are, are issues, but if you look at the people that have been looking at those two issues, the value adjustments appear to contain real power to predict teacher effectiveness as measured by uh, student achievement. St they're stable enough that we think they're giving us real information, and the bias is just not a big deal uh, overall. Although for an individual teacher, for the one teacher that the Principal Jones hates, maybe this is an issue for you. But over a, a city, you know, over the, the thing of a city, this is not a big deal. Okay, so they paired up teachers. Okay. Uh, in schools, and they measured the value added of those teachers, of each, each, each of those teachers. And they said, well, one of these teachers has a better value added measure than the other. We think that that teacher is better. So let's line them up on the x-axis in terms of the difference between their two value added. So over here, these are pairs where one teacher was really better than the other, and the pairs down there are pairs where they were fairly close in their value added. And then they randomly assigned those teachers classrooms the following year. So they actually ran the kind of experiment that we'd love to run, right? And they, let's compare outcomes for those teachers, kids, next year. Just look to see what happens to those kids. Well, what you see here, okay, these, these gray dots are the difference in student achievement for those kids the next year. And what you see is if you plot a line through this cloud of dots, you get something that, whoops, that's the wrong button. That, you get something that looks kind of like a 45 degree line, right? Which means that when you, got, when you move to the pairs where one is supposed to be a lot better than the other, lo and behold, the difference in their kids' outcomes are a lot different. And if you go to the pairs where they didn't seem to be all that different in the beginning, the kids' outcomes aren't all that different a year later. Okay? 